Bon, Julio, je vais te présenter en anglais, puisque le séminaire sera en anglais. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a uh, really a great pleasure uh, to have uh, Giulio Beroli uh, giving this talk. Uh, Giulio is a very special physicist, in my, in my opinion. Um, so let me tell you a few words about him, hopefully not embarrassing him too much. Uh, Giulio uh, did uh, uh, some of his undergraduate studies at the Ecole Polytechnique and then moved on to a PhD uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, he then went for a postdoc uh, at Rutgers University with, uh, in particular, Gabriel Cotlia. I think there you also collaborated with uh, Olivier Parcolet, mm -hmm. among others. Uh, and you already see from this that uh, he has this dual interest in statistical physics, which is uh, his main topic but also quantum physics. And I actually noticed that your paper on cluster dynamical mean filter is your third most cited paper. Yeah. <laughs> so both a quantum and a classical physicist. Uh, after his postdoc at Rutgers, uh, Julio moved uh, to a permanent position at the Institut de Physique Thorique uh, of the CEA Saclay, where he stayed for many years. And he really developed a superb uh, set of uh, research works on uh, statistical physics, on the statistical physics of glassy systems. Uh, in particular, I'm not going to name everything, but he's the author of a really remarkable achievement uh, that settles the question of whether there is a true uh, thermodynamic phase transition uh, at the glass transition. Uh, he has been the laureate of a number of awards, in particular the Prix d'Aumal de l'Académie des Sciences. Uh, and I think uh, a young investigator, a UPAP award long time ago, <laughs> among other things. And uh, recently, uh, Julio uh, was uh, successfully engaged into a multi-partner uh, Simon's collaboration program, which I think is entitled Cracking the Glass Problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Julio as a seminar speaker today. Um, He's going to tell us about something which is not exactly in line with the set of lectures on the Hubbard model, which is more in line with the set of lectures that I gave mm -hmm. two years ago on the dynamical mean field theory. He's going to tell us about how dynamical mean field theory has applications and interest for other fields than quantum physics. So, Julio, thank you very much, and the floor so, is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, thank you for inviting me here to give a seminar. So indeed, I, I know Antoine from a long time ago. He was my first teacher when I arrived in France and his course on statistical physics really made me love statistical physics and it was what I did for, for a long time after that. So today, indeed, I, I'm going to talk about dynamic mean field theory. So my idea was to show you the power and the different application of dynamic mean field theory in statistical physics, so in classical statistical physics, uh, hoping that Either you saw already, or yeah, you will see uh, in, uh, I mean, during your, uh, I mean, in the next months or during your research, dynamic mean field theory used for strongly correlated electrons. So you will, you will have, I mean, this, I, I want to show you what dynamic mean field theory can do actually in other fields. So just to have an idea, how many people know a little bit about dynamic mean field theory? Can you raise your hand in strongly correlated electrons? Great, perfect. So almost, almost everybody. All right. So let me start. So this was just uh, to tell you, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say anything about dynamic and mean field theory in strongly correlated electrons. So this is, but just to recall you very briefly what you can do. So you, if this is from a picture from, from the uh, uh, lecture by, by Antoine. So when you do dynamic and mean field theory, what you do is that you uh, focus on one degree of freedom, and then you, re you, you consider all the rest of the system as a bath. And this is what has been really successfully applied to the Hubbard model and in general to strongly correlated electrons. So if you go back to uh, two years ago, you rewind. And so Antoine gave a series of lectures uh, on, on dynamic and mean field theory and uh, so to application of the mod transition. So I think this is one of the most successful application of dynamic and mean field theory. And then there have been also cluster extension that have, I mean, from which one obtained many different interesting results, both on the theory of ITC, first principle method for strongly correlated materials, and surely many other things that actually I, I, I didn't follow. 
All right, so while well, this is just to, I mean, it's a brief, uh, very brief uh, recall of dynamic and field theory for quantum, in quantum physics, but what I'm going to do is <coughs> to focus on dynamic and field theory in classical physics. And so what I want to do is first, well, since it's uh, just after a lecture, I will use it a little bit as a lecture-like. So the first part will be, really, I will try to work you through uh, what is the MFT in classical statistical physics. And so to give you the idea, and you will see are similar to the, what you uh, already know from quantum physics, but there are maybe some, uh, some difference. And, and then I want to show you some applications. There are many applications. These are just three out of many. So the first one is on spin glassing and slow dynamics. The other one is actually on the glass transition. The third one is on ecosystem. And there would be others actually that I could do, but I don't have time. So for example, in neural networks and in uh, computer science. All right, so let me uh, start about what are the two key ingredients of dynamical mean field theory. And this, again, is something that you probably know already from, from quantum physics. But so the first thing is, in all cases in which you want to use dynamical mean field theory, whether it's classical or quantum, so the first important step is to, you have to identify what is the correct degree of freedom. So the degree of freedom that, I mean, is the one that you can treat uh, such that if you single out these degrees of freedom, degree of freedom, you can treat all the rest of the system as a bat. This is the first, the first point, and you will see, I mean, sometimes it's important if you don't find, if you don't fix the correct degree of freedom, then you cannot do the dynamical field theory. And then the second important point is that, well, you, you treat the rest of the system as a bath, but I mean, the rest of the system is statistically identical to the degree of freedom that you have singled out. And so then you can actually uh, do the self-consistency. So what you are going to say is that here you have, let's say, cavities, the single degree of freedom that you singled out. The rest of the system is a path, but the path actually is formed by degree of freedom which are identical uh, uh, to this one. And so you can close the equation, and this is why it's a mean field theory. So you can, studying the physics of this system in a path, you can find the property of the path, and then for the property of the bath, you find the property of the system of the uh, degree of freedom. So this is why you get a, 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 closed, a closed problem. So before actually show you uh, some example, I would like to spend a few uh, slides on what is a bath, what is a thermal bath. So of course, I'm sure you, you, uh, you know what is a thermal bath from your courses in uh, I mean, undergraduate courses, you know what, I mean, a thermal bath is already in, when you do the, uh, the MFT for quantum, for quantum system. But, well, let's see what is a thermal bath in, in, in uh, what is the role of a thermal bath in, in classical statistical physics. And to do this, so let me go back, this is really standard, but okay, let's, since, uh, uh, let me go back to the, the simplest thermal bath that you can do. So you, you take uh, a system, so let's say this is the Hamiltonian of the system, and the Hamiltonian has a part which is just the Hamiltonian of the system itself. There is a part which is the environment, will be the bath, and there is a part which is the interaction between system and environment. So well, the, simplest, uh, um, the simplest model of, of bath, of thermal bath, is going to be just well, independent harmonic oscillator, or if you want phonons. I mean, here I put an index K because, well, you can think that I've already diagonalized the normal modes. And so, well, if this is a classical system, but this is just, you can think, for example, to a degree of freedom in, uh, in a crystal, which is coupled to, to phonons. In any case, it's independent harmonic oscillator with some frequency. Uh, as simple degree of freedom, I just consider one particle, one dimensional particle in a certain external potential. And then I put the linear coupling between this degree of freedom X and all uh, the uh, uh, oscillator or the phonon, if you want. So this is the model. So it's a really simple model of bath. So I have a single degree of freedom coupled to many oscillator. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, to try to understand. So in principle, if there is no bath, you know what are the, the equation of motion for the system. It's just Newton equation with this Hamiltonian H, H system. Now, if you have a bath, now the equation of motion change. And what we want to understand is how they change, because this is going to be, uh, as you will see, you will find, we will find the same thing when we try to derive dynamic and mean field theory in classical physics. So the way to do it is that, while well, we start, let's say, from a bath which is at equilibrium, so it means that we draw the Q of K and the P of K from the Boltzmann distribution. And then in principle, what we have to do is that we have to solve the Newton equation of this coupled system, starting from a bath which is at equilibrium. 
So if you do this, what you get, but well, you write the equation, so this is the equation, Newton equation for the QK, these are the equation for the X for the particle. Now the way to do it uh, is that, well, in this case, since the bath is simple, are just harmonic oscillator, so you see that the equation uh, for the QK, so the uh, uh, bath particle or phonons, uh, have this term inside, which is, the cup, which is due to the coupling between the particle and the bath. Well, this is a, is a linear equation, differential linear equation, so you can solve it, so you can find the, let's say, the evolution of Q of K for a given particle trajectory X of T. So once you have Q of K as a function of X of T, you plug it in here, here you have Q of K, and you get the closed equation on X of T. And the closed equation that you get is this one, which is nice because you see that first, I mean, if there is no bath, there is not this term, there is not this term, and there is not this term. You have just Newton equation on X. Because of the bath, the effective equation on X contains three different terms, and two of them are really important. So the, this term here is, well, it's like a friction or dissipation. So while k, k of t, you can write it in terms of the property of the bath, so the harmonic oscillator, is, we can write it in this way. And when the bath is large, so when you have many, many uh, oscillator k, depending on this gamma k of omega k, this k of t will become a nice smooth function which decreases to zero when t goes to infinity. It has a kind of, let's say, bell shape with some oscillation. So this is the important, one important term. The other important term is that xi of t, you have xi of t, again, when the uh, thermal bath is very, is, very, is very big, so you have many, many different oscillators which oscillate with different frequency and we start, that start from a uh, random initial condition, then you have a contribution, xi of t, that even though it's a deterministic function, is statistically identical to a, a, run, to a noise, to a, Gaussian, to a Gaussian random noise. And here, it's, this average is just to say that this is, I mean, you cannot, just, uh, you cannot just make the difference. It's exactly like when you do Monte Carlo simulation and you introduce some disorder, some randomness. I mean, it's a deterministic randomness, but for all practical purposes, you cannot just, if the thermal bath is very large, you cannot make the difference. So this is a Gaussian force. And as you see here, this Gaussian force, it's equivalent to a Gaussian random uh, noise, which has a covariance, which is kBT times k, which is the k which is here. So you see that you have a relationship between the noise, the thermal noise, and the dissipation, which is the classical relationship that you have when you have a thermal bath, which is at equilibrium. So this, I think, are, well, and then you have actually another term, which is a kind of, uh, it's a, an effective, force on the system due to the fact that the particle X is moving in, in, in a bath. Okay, this is not, I mean, it's not so important for, for what I want to say in the following. So these two terms are really important. And it's something that <clears throat> you should think, I mean, again, when I say that I have a particle and the rest of the system is the bath, I, if I have a big system, I can always take one part of the system and, and, and declare that the rest of the system is the bath. And now what is the main effect of the rest of the system of one particle? So there are always these two effects. This is really important. So if the rest of the system, you know that because of its evolution, it will give sometimes energy and sometimes it will pick energy from the particle X in a random way. And this is the Gaussian, the thermal noise uh, that oh, you always have. And then there is the other term, <coughs> which is that, well, you know, it's friction. When you have a system, when you have a particle that interacts with many, many other, with an environment or many other particles, you always have some friction or some dissipation. So, well, you know, I mean, if, if, if a particle is moving at a constant speed just because of the interaction with the others, it will lose energy. And the, but then at a certain time, I mean, it's, the speed is not going to go into zero because it will also gain energy from the random interaction with, 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 with the other particles. So these two terms are really the two fundamental interactions that come from one particle with the rest of the system, with the bath. All right, and so you see here that you go naturally from Newton equation, when you take Newton equation for the entire system, this is, uh, these are the, the equation of evolution for the entire system, but if you focus just on the particle X, you go from Newton to Langevin, in which you have these two terms, Langevin generalized friction, because it has a time dependence, and thermal noise. Okay. So this is, well, what is a bath in classical statistical physics? Actually, you can do similar things also in quantum physics. If you think, I mean, it's, this is a famous caldera like that uh, uh, model, and you can do it using, for example, schwinger keldish You have, of course, you cannot write down equations which are like this, but you have always these two effects, something which is a kind of friction, 
uh, one role which is a kind of friction and one role which is a kind of thermal noise. All right, so now let's go back to, to the MFT. So in the MFT, uh, as I told you, there are two steps that one has to do. First, identify the correct degree of freedom, and second, close the equation, declaring that the bath is just formed by degree of free, the same degree of freedom that, that you have here. So just to show you how it works, I will go through the derivation, I mean quickly, a sketch of the derivation in one particular case. All right. Okay, so here, uh, so this is just, I will come back to spin glasses later, to the physics of spin glasses, but now for the moment, I will start with the question of motion for, uh, let's say, soft spins. So these are my equation of motion. So I consider, so SI is a, is a real variable. And uh, it's a real variable uh, uh, that satisfies a Langevin equation. So I already consider that spins in a material are coupled to a thermal bath. And these spins are interacting via some couplings, uh, G, uh, J, I, K. So this is the interaction, the spin-spin interaction. Then there is some potential V, and I choose the potential V in this way, S square minus one square, in such a way that actually the value of S that are favor are the ones which are close to uh, plus one and close to minus one. So this is just, V is just a double well potential like this. And so the equation of motion are SI dot is equal, there is a part which is just a self interaction. It just power the fact that S is representing a soft spin. So there are just the value plus one and minus one which are favored. And then there is a spin spin interaction. And then there is thermal noise, which is just the typical thermal noise. Here I didn't put the KVT uh, because the system is coupled to a bath. So in principle, this equation is the equation that one has to study uh, if one wants to understand the uh, uh, dynamics of spin glasses. So spin glasses are magnetic materials in which you have spins which are coupled, effectively coupled by random interaction. And one model that has been uh, studied a lot is a mean field model in which actually you decide that these uh, couplings, G, J, I, K, are uh, among all spins. So instead of having J, I, K, for example, on, on a cubic lattice, in order to do a mean field approximation, you know, as you know, when you know the mean field approximation for the Ising model, you declare that each spin is coupled to all the other because this simplifies the problem. Here is the same, each spin is coupled to all the other, but now the couplings is a random variable, is quenched. So it's fixed from the beginning. So instead of having the Ising standard for magnetic Ising model, all the couplings are positive, here the couplings are just draw at random, and we can take Gaussian random couplings with a variance which goes like one over n, where n is the number of spins. This is again, is similar to what you have seen, I'm sure, for the ice ferromagnetic Ising model. In that case, you take couplings which are positive and they're all of order one over n. So to get a good limit when n go to infinity. So it's here is similar, except that now, uh, you have to take to get a good limit when n go to infinity, you have to take the, the variance of this coupling, it's of order one over n. Okay, so this defines the mean field model of spin glasses. And now, well, in the mean field model of spin glasses, what one, one would like to do is to study the dynamics of this system. And the dynamics, so the one way to study the dynamics is doing dynamical mean field theory. And so let me show you again how you do it. And you will see it's very similar to the derivation of the Langevin equation when you have a bath. So you write, well, you look at the equation, and so you, you consider the degree SI as the degree of freedom, which I call the cavity, or the special degree of freedom. So SI is coupled to all other uh, spins. So what you can do, exactly like before, if you remember what I did for the thermal bath, I say I have the degree of freedom X, I have all the other degree of freedom, Q of K, I solve the equation on Q of K as a function of X, and so now I take Q of X, I put it back on the equation on, uh, uh, sorry, I have Q of K as a function of X, I put it back in the equation on X, and I find a closed equation on X, which is the Langevin equation. And here you do the same. So you have SI is the special degrees of, degree of freedom. You have SK, which are all the other spins. And if you look to the equation for all the other spins, you see that you have, well, this term, which is of order one, this term, which is of order one, this term, which is of order one, but then this term here, because the couplings are of order one over square root of n is small. So actually, while well, you can, well, first you can try to solve this equation in perturbation theory in, in, the, in this term. So you solve exactly this equation formally in perturbation theory on this term. And once you have the solution of all the dynamics of S of k as a function of S of i, you plug it back in equation of S of i, which, in which there are all the S of k. 
And so the way you do it, the way to do it is, is the following. So you, when you consider the equation of S of i, so you can say, well, since this is a small perturbation to all the equation on S of k, well, I do perturbation theory. So this is really another important concept when you try to derive dynamic and infinite theory equations. So there is S0, which is the solution of this equation when this term is not there. So this is the first uh, uh, term. And then there is a correction, which is due to the fact that in all the equation on S of k, there is this term. And now I call this correction delta S0 of k. Now, these two terms, if you look at them, so this term here, you see, I mean, you here you have this spin SK, which are evolving exactly as if this term wasn't there. So this really is like a bath, uh, in which is not seeing the system, it's not seeing the, uh, the spin SI. And so you, here you really can show, since these, are all cap, these couplings are all uh, random variables, which are actually uncorrelated from this uh, uh, S of K, you can really show, again, that this has all the statistical properties of a Gaussian force, because all the S of K have their own dynamics, which is erratic. You sum all this an erratic function with coefficients which are Gaussian variable, and at the end, this will be just like a Gaussian force. And now here instead you have a, a, a term, you have to work a little bit more, but you, what you can show is that if you do linear perturbation theory to this equation, this term gives you a term which is like this. So the effective equation at the end is this one. So you have SI dot, then you have this term and this term, which are the original one. Then you have actually a noise, eta i of t, which come from this term here, and you have a kind of uh, generalized friction which come exactly when you consider this term. In the context of spin glasses, this is called the Onzaga reaction term. It's a reaction because this is the, due to the fact that the degree of freedom SI has an effect of the bath on the bath, and then the bath has an effect back on the uh, degree of freedom SI. And this is what, in a certain sense, friction, friction is about. So here you see it's a little bit more general than before, but so here what it enters is what is called the response function, is the response function of the bath when you applied a field hk to the bath, and then you put hk to zero. And here you have eta i, which are, is a correlation function, uh, so it's, it's a Gaussian noise, and this, the covariance of this Gaussian noise is related actually to the correlation function um, of, the, uh, of, of the bath. So it's sum over k, sk of t, sk of s. Okay, so these two, in principle, are property of the bath. If this is the response function of the bath, uh, or, the, or the rest of the system, this is the correlation function of, of the bath. And here is the question that you get. If you remember the equation that I showed you before for the thermal bath was slightly different, you had that this R was actually, well, first there was a dot here, and then here you had the kernel, which was related to the covariance of the noise. This indeed is what you will get if the bath is at equilibrium. If the bath is at equilibrium, then the response function is related to the correlation function. This is the fluctuation dissipation theorem. But in principle, here we, we might want to study system out of equilibrium, and we are going to study system out of equilibrium. So now the bath can be out of equilibrium. And in this case, this term here, the generalized friction, is not related to the, uh, to the thermal noise. So this is, well, this is the, uh, what, what, what you get uh, when you do this perturbation theory. Now, the fact is that well, let me maybe just go directly to the self-consistency. So in the self, well, maybe I go back here. So now the thing is that now you can declare that each spin S of K statistically behave exactly like the spin SI. There is no difference. So this means actually that this equation is a closed equation in the sense that you should think in this way. Imagine that you start with a certain function R and a certain, certain function C. So if you know R and you know C, you know what is the statistic of eta i, and you know, well, you can solve this equation, so you, you just draw many eta i, you know R, you solve this equation. And now you have a statistics of SI. Once you have the statistic of SI, now you can compute the correlation function of SI. But again, if SI is the same thing of S of K, this will give you another guess for the correlation function C. And similarly, you can add the field here, and you can compute the response function of SI, and get a new guess for the, the uh, response function R. And then you can plug it back, and I mean the solution of dynamical mean field theory will be when you get an R and C, you put it there, and then you solve in this equation, you find again the same R and the same C. So the system, the, the uh, degree of freedom, is behaving exactly like the bath. 
okay? Because the bath is nothing else than uh, a sum of degree of freedom which are statistically identical to SI. So this is how the self-consistency works. And again, it's very similar, I think, in, to what you have seen for dynamical mean field theory for strongly correlated electrons, even though the equations are, are clearly different. So, okay, so let, let me recap. So the first thing, and I stress this, is that an important step of dynamical mean field theory is first identify the correct degree of freedom, and you will see why I insist on this. So in the case of the Abbar model, it, maybe it's easy, and, uh, but in other cases, it, it can be tricky. And then what you do is that you really, one of the important points is that the effect on the, this degree of freedom, on the cavity, on the rest of the system has to be, it's important that it's small. Either it's small because you consider a model in which is small, this is the mean field model that I consider, or if you want to describe a three-dimensional system, this is where one of the key approximations are. So the effect of one degree of freedom on the rest is small, you treat it in linear perturbation theory, and then in this way, you plug it back on the equation on, on the uh, degree of freedom, uh, and this way you get these two terms, generalized friction and thermal noise. And then you close the equation, declaring that this degree of freedom, I mean, the bath is formed by the same degree of freedom and that behaves statistically in the same way. So from the, uh, let's say, generalized friction current and thermal noise, you solve the cavity dynamics. From the cavity dynamics, you, you get a new guess for the friction kernel and the covariance of the noise, and so on and so forth. And once you, this uh, cycle, self-consistent cycle, it gives you the same friction kernel, the same thermal noise, you have solved the problem. So in the context of, I don't know, actually, the, 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 I should have maybe done uh, more work uh, on this, but I don't know exactly the history, so wh when dynamical mean field theory appeared before. In the concept of statistical physics, I know for spin glasses, I think uh, it was used and introduced substantially by Sompolinsky and Zipelio in 1982. Uh, at least the formalism, uh, the cavity, the kind of, it's called cavity derivation of dynamical mean field theory that I present, as far as I know, was, is, is in this book. But then there are many, many other studies in statistical physics. Uh, in the case of quantum system, again, I, I, I'm not, I think maybe, I, I'm not sure, but, uh, well, there is the uh, uh, lectures of Antoine two years ago. I'm sure he, he, he quote all the uh, important people. And here there is a very nice review in modern physics in which they discuss a lot on dynamical infiltration for strongly correlated electrons. Okay, this I, let's say, my important reference, at least, uh, on this, for the beginning of dynamical mean field theory. All right, so maybe here, if there are quick questions, so what I wanted to do first is to give you an idea of what dynamical mean field theory is in classical physics, because well, there are some similarities, but there may be, may be also some difference with what you know for in the quantum case. And now, actually, I would like to show you uh, three different applications. I will be a bit fast, it will be an overview, but just to tell you what kind of uh, physical phenomena one can capture using dynamical mean field theory. So if you have some quick questions on the formalism, maybe now it's a good time. No? All right. So maybe yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. So indeed, so it's, you don't need to have spins. You can do it, yeah, for many, many different systems. And now in the application, I will show you quite different systems. Uh, yes, exactly. So the only thing, it was an example in which I wanted just to try to, to give you what, what was the idea on how one derived dynamic Can material. Sorry? Can it be done for actual glasses? Yep, so I will, I will tell you. I mean, yes, I will tell you just, this is the second application. Yes. Maybe a simple question, but so it works, right? Because you assume it's Gaussian, uh, not specific Gaussian, but it's completely random, right? Because otherwise, if you use, if you use random in the nor some normal terms, like like Anderson model, then of course it, the the potential will be different in different spots. But here, it's really it's the same randomness in each position, right? It's the same randomness. So you mean the so for, okay? Let me go back. So the here is the Ah, I see, I see the point. So, yeah, so I mean, here the fact is that, uh, so each side has different couplings with all the others. 
So in a sense, it's a little bit like in the Anderson model in which you, different, you have different epsilon i. The fact is that here, since you have many, so many connections, what you have is that the statistics for the statistics of this force is the same for each for each side. So here is a Gaussian. I mean, here I have to draw a Gaussian. Here I have to draw another Gaussian, and so on and so forth. So I mean, from this point, I mean the Anderson model. I, you, once you give the uh, so if you think to the uh, localization, I think uh, for an Anderson model. So you declare what is the distribution of the uh, local energy, and so for each side, then you draw one local energy from this distribution. So here is similar from each side. You draw. Gaussian variables. So then, yes, I mean, it's the fact that this Gaussian is really related to the fact that you have many, so many connections that becomes a Gaussian. So it works in a, in a let's say, toy model in which everybody is connected to everybody. In three dimension, it's just an approximation. Clearly, the force is not a Gaussian. But I mean, it's a, you, you do what you can, and so you declare that it's a Gaussian. And then probably, if it's not a Gaussian, but it doesn't have very long tails, it's OK. If in the physics there is some reason why you should have something uh, with long tails, which is very different from a Gaussian, then the approximation is wrong. OK. Yeah? When you solve the self consistent equation, is it clear that there is just a unique solution? Uh, so, so if you, yes. So, um, OK, how I can say? So, there is a way to solve the equation. Uh, step by step in time, which will give you just one solution physically. I mean, there is just only one physical solution. You might have a physical solution which doesn't respect causality, but if you think, if you, if you say, I want a physical solution, you really can construct it step by step in time, and so there is just one. But you may depend on the initial condition. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. It's at fixed initial condition, yes. If, well, Yes, 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 definitely. OK, so if there are no urgent questions, I go on. Application. So the first application I want to discuss on is on spin glasses. It's not so new, but I think it's in a, in a, a talk on dynamic and mean field theory in statistical physics. I think it's an important uh, uh, application. So spin glasses, as I told you, are spins that interact with random couplings. And I call spin glasses because their dynamics is very slow. And when you do experiment at low temperature, they never go to equilibrium. And so here is an example. And they, they do uh, they display a physical phenomenon which is called aging, which means that the system relaxes slowly and slowly. The longer you wait, the slower is the system, but it never reach equilibrium. So it always remains out of equilibrium if you go below a certain temperature. And here is just to show you this effect. So here is, while well, it's from experiments on spin glasses, this is called the zero field cool susceptibility. So let me explain you what, what you get. Is that here you, uh, so you have a system, you cool it at low temperature, below what is called the glass transition temperature. Then you wait a certain time, and then you apply a field. So the, the time that you wait is called T waiting, which is here. And, uh, and then when you apply a field, you uh, measure the magnetization and you divide by H. So if the system was at equilibrium, it doesn't depend how much you weight. I mean, the system is time translation invariant. But here, you clearly see that it's not the case. So here is what you have. You have different curve depending on T weighting. And you also see that the longer you expect uh, you, you wait before putting the field, the slower is the system. So this is from experiments. This is from actually simulation, numerical simulation of an Eisenberg three-dimensional spin glass. And these are the correlation function. So correlation function is, well, I, I described it before, so let me maybe go back. This is the typical correlation function. So it, it just tells you, uh, so when you look at the correlation function between time t and between time s, it tells you, OK, if I have the state of the system at time t, how much the system at time s has decorrelated from the state at which it was at time t. So if the correlation function is 0, there is no memory of, the, of what the system was at time t. Well, if it's very close to 1, the system is really not forgot, forget what it was at time t. And here, well, what you, see, what you see is that, again, here you have, I mean, it's a, a small temperature. t is the temperature of the thermal bath at which the system is coupled. And this curve, again, corresponds to different weighting, I think it's t weighting here, weighting time. So it's the correlation function between t plus t weighting and t weighting. So it means that the system has arrived at time t weighting. 
and then I compare the state of the system at time t weighting with the system at t weighting plus t. Again, if the system was at equilibrium, no dependence on uh, t weighting, there is time translation invariance. And instead here, well, what you see is that there is a clear dependence on t weighting. These are growing t weighting. And the, the, grid, uh, the uh, bigger is t weighting, the longer it takes to the system to decorrelate uh, from itself. So it means that if I wait a long time, then I will take an even, an even bigger time to decorrelate from, to, to lose the memory uh, of what I was at the time TW. I hope it's clear. So this, well, it's called aging. In a certain sense, the system becoming slower and slower and slower. And it never, so the important thing is that the system at equilibrium has a typical time scale, which is the time scale over which, uh, let's say, has uh, equilibrium fluctuation. Here, the time scale, there is not a priori time scale. The time scale is set by the age of the system. So if the system is very old, then its relaxation will take a very long time. There is not an inherent time scale. Okay, so the system is out of equilibrium, it age, and so one important question now in statistical physics at that time was, can we get this phenomenon? Can we get this phenomenon? And this is not easy because you have uh, left the realm of equilibrium statistical physics in which there are many techniques that have been developed. Here, you, well, you try to get a non-equilibrium phenomenon, which is not, it's not easy, but while well, dynamical mean field theory, in a sense, it's is what can do, it really can get complex dynamical phenomena. And so this is what has been done indeed. So let me just again go back. I mean, this is a one possible model of, of a uh, uh, dynamics of a spin glass. Uh, we derived this equation, which is for soft spins. And now, as I, as I stress, in this equation, since the system is not at equilibrium, this uh, response function is not related in principle to the correlation function. And now if you want to solve, to find uh, uh, this aging phenomenon within dynamic mean field theory, what you have to, so if, I mean, it's, if it's equilibrium, as I told you, you have R and C, which are related by FTT and our time translation invariance. If you have aging dynamics, the thing is that the bath, since it's like the degree of freedom, the bath is aging. So it means that the, cyst, the degree of freedom is coupled to a bath, which is out of equilibrium and is aging. And so the degree of freedom has its own dynamics coupled to this bath, which is aging. And then the bath itself is aging because it's formed by degree of freedom that are aging uh, themselves. And so what you have to do to try to get this uh, um, aging phenomenon is to try to find uh, a solution of dynamical mean field theory in which you have this R and C, which are slow because the bath is slow and aging. So the term of bath is aging. The degree of freedom is aging because of this bath. And then you close the equation because the bath is formed by this degree of freedom. So this and this, well, in principle, one could think that, I mean, it's just, there is no hope to try to do such a thing because, well, it's, the system is out of equilibrium, so you have no guidelines. But actually, it was done, uh, and it was shown, really, that there is a critical temperature such that if you are above a certain temperature, if you wait a long time, the system goes at equilibrium. So it means that R and C at long time are related by FTT, and you get time translation invariance. And instead, if you are below this temperature, so you really have an ergodicity breaking, and below this temperature, the system in the thermodynamic limit, it never goes to equilibrium. And again, there are many people that contributed to this, uh, um, uh, to this physics and to this solution, but I would say, I mean, the first, the two pioneering works on this are done by, by Kuliander and Kurchan, and then just one year later by Franz and Mazar. And now there is actually one, uh, something that was really non-trivial that was found and, well, I don't know how many people know this, but the, uh, in the case of spin glasses, uh, there is a theory of the equilibrium uh, spin glass transition in which there is a low temperature phase, uh, which is very intricate, which is described by what is called the uh, Parisi full replica symmetry breaking, on which I don't want to enter. Now, the nice thing is that when you do the dynamics, you find the same thing, and you find it in a way which is very, in a certain sense, very appealing. So what you find is that the system, while well, has a very complicated energy landscape, and so it's always out of equilibrium because there is an emergence of many, many different time scale. So you have a certain time scale uh, over which the system is, let's say, aging, is low, and then there are another uh, time scale over which degrees of freedom still, have a, still are aging, but it's larger, and so on and so forth. And you have actually an infinite hierarchy of time scale and time sector 
uh, over which the system is doing this aging behavior. So this is also why the system never gets to equilibrium, because it's slow and has a certain time scale over which there is some kind of non-trivial aging dynamics. But if you go to longer time scale, while there is another time sector over which the system is not at equilibrium, has a non-trivial aging dynamics. All right, so, well, this is, I'm not, I, probably it's not clear at all, but it's just to tell you that, yes, you can find a closed solution on which to describe the aging dynamics, and this uh, closed solution is really, really non-trivial. And now, while I told you these things about the classical system, but actually you can generalize this to quantum systems, since I'm, uh, well, you're much more interested to quantum systems, so you can take a system which is quantum, in which you have a disorder, uh, which is coupled to uh, a bath, uh, uh, and so it has, some, it has its own thermal dynamics. And then you can try to study using dynamical, some version of dynamical mean field theory, if at low temperature you can find aging in a quantum system. And the, and the answer is yes, and if you're interested, so there is a first paper by Culiandro Rosano in 1999, and then I, I work with this uh, on, with Olivier Parcouret when I was a postdoc in Rutgers, and we showed that this kind of well, not exactly this, but this, the aging phenomenon can be described also in quantum system using some version of the NFT. All right, so this is my first application that I want to show you. This is a little bit old in a sense, but it's, what I want to show you is really is that the NFT can get really uh, non-trivial and complex dynamical phenomena, and so this is the first one. And then uh, there is a second one that I want to discuss, which is uh, the glass transition. So here, so before, you had spins that interact with random interaction. Here is the model, is, even though it's called glass, uh, it's completely different. So now you have particle, molecules actually, that interact with a two-body potential. There is no disorder at all. All particles are the same, or all molecules are the same. But what is known is that more or less, if you take more or less any kind of molecular liquid, and if you cool the liquid fast enough in order to avoid the crystallization transition, so the liquid enter in a metastable phase, in which is called supercooled, and then in this supercooled phase, which is, I mean, it's metastable, it's all, all equilibrium properties are verified. So if you decrease the temperature, the relaxation time actually grows enormously. So it goes up, so here, what I show you here, this is the log of the viscosity, which is, well, you can think is just proportional to the relaxation time for many liquids, uh, and this is a function of Tg over T, uh, so, well, that's the only thing I wanted to show that actually if you change the temperature of a, a regime which is not that big, so let's say of something like two-thirds, the relaxation time of the system shoots up of 14 order of magnitude, which is one, I mean, it's, it's really an impressive change of relaxation time. So it goes from picoseconds, which is, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's super small, to hours. So it means that really a molecule to move of something like uh, the typical interparticle distance Normal liquid, it takes a picosecond, and when you reach what is called the glass transition, it takes an hour. Just a single tiny molecule to move, to move a few Armstrong, uh, it takes uh, uh, a few hours. So, so here you have just no disorder, particles that are interacting together, and you have an extremely big slowing down of the dynamics. And so again, this is a complex dynamical phenomenon, and one question is, can we get this using some kind of dynamical mean theory? And well, the answer is yes, but I, what I want to stress is that actually this problem has been studied for, for a long time using some kind of effective models. Now, the problem is that trying to get dynamical mean field theory for particles without disorder and in the continuum is really a difficult job. It's, it's something that uh, it's, it's really difficult and was actually done only recently. And uh, so the, in principle, while well, it's clear what the problem is, a little bit like in the upper case, I mean, the model is simple. So you have n particles which are interacting with this two-body potential. These are the equation. Uh, you start at equilibrium. You just want to study equilibrium dynamics. But you want to describe why the dynamics slow down so much when you decrease the temperature. So here I show you, just to show you, I mean, what, what, what is the trajectory of a typical particle. So here, it's a, I mean, it's, what you, it's just one particle which is embedded in all the others. So this is already something that, I mean, it's what we want to capture maybe with dynamic I mean, theory. So this particle, I'm just showing the trajectory of this particle, not of all the others, and just a 2D section. So what you get is that this particle, because all the other, has all the other around, it just vibrate because it's caged from all the other, and from time to time find a way to escape and hop, it goes to another position. So the typical trajectory of a particle in 
It's called a glass. It's like this. It rattles in a cage, then it goes another place, then it goes in another place. So the different colors correspond to different uh, cages. One other way to describe, uh, let's say, in a more statistical and concrete way, is to look into the mean square displacement. So you just take uh, the displacement, you took it square, and you take it uh, the, the average. So this is delta of t. And this is the behavior that you get. So in a typical high temperature liquid, you have first a ballistic regime. So just, I mean, the particle just goes straight because a certain velocity. And then you go in a diffusive regime. So this is a log log. This is the high temperature liquid. In a low temperature liquid, when the system is almost a glass, and this is from a numerical simulation, you get that the system first stop in something which is like a cage for a long time. And then only at very long time, he, he, uh, he, gets, to diff I mean, he gets to diffusion. So these are the typical things that you can get from experiment on from, on for, on from simulation. And this increase here that you have here is the increase of the relaxation time. Okay, so here is not many order of magnitude because it comes from molecular dynamic simulation. But this is the physics that we would like to get. I mean, that the system becomes trapped, it takes long time to escape from the cage, and the dynamic becomes lower and slower. So how to get dynamic amine filter in this case? So this is what was understood recently. Well, one way to do it, well, you know that when you try to do dynamic amine filter, you always have to take some limit if you want that the uh, DMFT is exact. And here is the infinite dimensional limit, as in many cases. Now, in the infinite dimensional limit, what you have to do is you have to scale properly the interaction between the degrees of freedom. And here, the way to scale the interaction is if you call L, uh, well, you fix uh, a, uh, a unit of uh, length, L. And here you see the scale, you have the, the, the interaction between two particles should go like a function of V times R minus 1. So it means that actually all the interaction here, I mean, all the action are when R is of order of L plus 1 over D. So here is what I try to say is that when I have a particle here, when D goes to infinity with the scaling, you have that all the interesting interaction comes at a distance which is L times, uh, sorry, plus something which is of order 1 over D. And uh, so it also means that if you look at the dynamics, the displacement, the kind of displacement that you have, so UI, which I call it the displacement, it's, if I start at equilibrium, it will, go, will be of order 1 over V. So well, these are the scaling that one has to do. And the interesting thing is that when you take a very, in a very large dimension, if I consider a particle which is here, it interacts with particles which are there. This particle interacts with other particles, but now the particles that are here, which are a distance which is of order L from this particle, are typically not at a distance which is L from this particle. So what you see here is a kind of tree-like structure, which tells you already that maybe there is some, some kind of mean field uh, treatment that can work. So I mean, just to cut the short start, is that the, uh, here the good uh, degree of freedom is the displacement of a given particle in a random direction of space, which I call UI alpha. So if you realize this, then you can obtain a dynamic amine field theory for this system. And this is what has been done. So once you, you do exactly the same procedure that I told you before, and you get for the displacement of a particle in a random direction, you get this kind of equation. Or here you have a random force, and here you have a kernel. And the kernel is related to the uh, covariance of the random force because we are at equilibrium. And then you can have also self-consistency. I mean, this kernel, you can get it when you consider a two-particle process. So you are just considering two particles here. And you, as direction alpha, you take the direction uh, which is between, uh, in, between the two particles, beta. And here you, you solve this problem of two particles. And once you solve this problem of two particles, then you have some statistics for this force. And the correlation of this force, which is here, gives you the kernel. So the idea is that, well, you, again, you have to solve this self-consistently. So I'm not going too much into the detail because it's more tricky, but it was also to show you really one example in which DMFT is a little bit different from the usual DMFT when you have a lattice uh, uh, behind. So when you have a lattice, it's much more easy to get dynamic amplitude theory. Here, I think people didn't get it for a long time, and I think it was really an achievement because particles are in the continuum and it wasn't clear at all how you do a dyna dynamic amine field theory. So while the, der I mean, this derivation with, which is, has a, this, ki this kind of derivation is what something was done, was actually done in this, in this work. But the derivation of this dynamic amine field theory equation actually was derived not with this kind of, let's say, 
cavity derivation that I described in this lecture, but was done first using some field theory arguments in, in this work. And now the achievement of this dynamic amine field theory in this context is that, well, first, you have an exact solution for interacting particle, many, so the, let's say, many body problem, many classical many body problem in the limit of infinite dimension, which surprisingly was done for, for example, strongly correlated electrons, but was not known for classical particle in the continuum, and was done just recently. The other interesting thing is that, well, if you solve dynamic amine field theory equation, then you get a glass transition. So you find that above a certain temperature, which I would call TD, the system uh, has some normal uh, and fast dynamics. And then when you approach TD, the relaxation time of the system shoots up. And here is, for example, the uh, behavior of the mean square displacement that you get solving the equation of dynamic amine field theory. This is just to show you something which is similar to the, what I showed you before, which came from simulation of three-dimensional systems. So you have ballistics and diffusive. And the more you go closer to the uh, TD, so here is phi because it's, it's density. You can change the density or you can change the temperature in, in the grid. So you see that you have a plateau that is forming, and then you get to the diffusive behavior at longer and longer time. So this, I think it's a great result. Now, but there is something which is really missing, and here the MFT is uh, failing in a bad way, meaning that it gets actually that the relaxation time increase and then actually diverge at a certain point but it diverged too quickly. Uh, so it diverged at a temperature which is, or, or um, let's say a temperature which is too high. So it means that it gets some part of the slowing down, but it's not able actually to really describe what happens in experiments. So it means that in experiments, you can go to a temperature at which dynamic amine theory tells you the system is a glass, the relaxation time is infinite, but clearly it's not true. The system is just uh, very viscous, but it's still, it's still a liquid. So it's really missing something. And here is, is a regime in which, well, what we call non-perturbative on one over D uh, effect, which are really, I think, cooperative effect that takes place uh, on short time scale. And this is known from, I mean, many other approaches. So when you go closer to the experimental glass transition, there are cooperative phenomena that takes place. So one particle is, is blocked by the others, but then actually you have some move that you can do, which are cooperative. Uh, which can make unblock the system. And these kind of things you cannot get with the MFT because the MFT take one particle and it's a, a, just an average bath all around. But here is, I think it's a regime, and this is something on which we are working now, I think in which cluster extension of dynamic amine field theory that were so successful for strongly correlated electrons can be really successful here. And for the same reason. So here the fact is that so there are non-perturbative effects we have our, which happens on very short time scale. So it's a short, short, sorry, length scale of two or three particles, which are really uh, responsible for the extremely slow dynamics that the MFT is not catching. And if we get this cooperative effect on length scale, which is two or three, then we can describe actually what is seen in experiment in a quantitative way. So I think this is really a great, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very potential progress, important progress. It's a great challenge. It's also difficult because, again, we don't have a lattice, so we should think how to do cluster extension of this dynamic amine field theory in the continuum. And, well, this is what on which we, uh, something on which we are working right now. Julio, yeah. The fact that the meeting approach overestimates the glass transition temperature is not so surprising, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I think what you want to say is more than this. It's, it's the fact the way the relaxation time diverges at the transition yeah. is qualitatively incorrect. Yes. Exactly. Can you explain a bit more to the readers? Yes, yes, right. So the, um, uh, so the, what dynamic amine field theory actually predict is that the relaxation time diverge like one over T minus, it's called TD, to the gamma. So it's a power law relaxation, which is the usual that you get in standard phase transition. What you get in experiments, while we don't know exactly, let's say, let's say good fit, a good fit of what you see in experiment is something which goes like exponential of a constant divided by, let's say, let me call it t minus t, uh, uh, tc, okay? So, I mean, it's, this is just a fit. Of course, you cannot go too close to tc because, well, this becomes very big and it's in the exponential, so the time scale increases very much. But it tells you already why the time scale increases so much in experiments because you have an essential singularity compared to a power law singularity. So the IMFT really gives you this. You can work out even the exponent. 
And this is clearly not what you see. It's what you see maybe at the beginning, indeed, when you start to decrease the temperature, the time scale starts to go, goes up. But if you want to just describe the first six decades of slowing down, this is good. But then, actually, so let me say, here is the temperature, here is tau. So let's say that this is what you, this is log tau. What you see in experiment is something like this. What you see from, let's say, dynamic amine field theory is something like this. So this will be the TD of dynamic amine field theory. So let's say that here is the putative TC from experiments. So here, you see, first it uh, diverged before, and then it diverged in a way which is not at all this one. So you could think that maybe, I mean, one could, be, one could think maybe the MFT is not getting right the temperature, but it's not that the MFT is not getting right the temperature, so I can just shift this here. No, it's really getting wrong the, uh, the divergence. So clearly there is physics which is not captured here, which it's important here. And I mean, some physics here, if you think when you have a, this kind of divergence, it really means that if you think this to this like uh, some exponential of some, let's say, free energy barrier divided by the temperature, if you just be a little bit naive. So this means that here you have diverging free energy barrier at the transition. And this is really the phenomenon that one wants to capture, and this is the phenomenon which I think can be captured when you have this cooperation on, on short length scale that can be captured, I think, using cluster extension of dynamic amine field theory. All right, so now I can go uh, to the uh, last part, which is the, uh, the MFT for, uh, ec for ecological problems, which I probably is the, uh, uh, the thing which is far away uh, possible from, 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 from quantum system uh, that you're interested in. But I think there is something interesting to say. So there have been, so in recent years, there have been a lot of, inter uh, of, a lot of interest to understand ecosystems. So people have studied a lot biology from a quantitative point of view also evolution from a quantitative point of view. But then they start to think that if you want to study these problems from a quantitative point of view, you have to consider also that there's not just evolution, people in, uh, sorry, species interact. Uh, and, and this is a very important part of the problem if you want to understand how, I mean, many, many species, the dynamics of uh, ensemble of many species. And well, uh, there are many interesting questions actually that one can try to answer. So I think one first, one important point is that in many experiments, people now try to uh, understand and to measure properties of many species interacting together. For many, I, I mean, I mean 1,000 or even more. And I mean, for a long time, theoretical ecology was something on when I mean, the species were things like I don't know different species of grass. Now, what really boosts uh, uh, all the experiments is now that well, this is the modern ecosystem. So, for example, all the bacteria that are interacting together, for example, in some part of the human body. And there are many experiments on this, and there is no theory. Also because the theory in theoretical ecology was based, a lot of it, actually on few species interacting together. And it was a theory based mathematically on dynamical system. Now, when you go to many species interacting together, then this becomes the re enter really in the realm of well, what we know in statistical physics. So this is why, I mean, there are several statistical physics that are studying this kind of these questions. There are many open questions which are interesting. I have no time to treat all of them, but one that I would just to briefly uh, address is, for example, is this one. Can endogenous fluctuations survive in a large interacting ecosystem? So what do I mean by this? Is that, well, if you have species interacting, you can think that the system can go to an equilibrium and then stay there. But sometimes when you do experiment, you see that, well, it's actually a, a, an ecosystem has many fluctuations. Now the question is, are these fluctuations due to the environment or there is some internal dynamics of the ecosystem which create this fluctuation? And there was uh, a big debate on the fact that you cannot have this endogenous fluctuation that for physicists it will be a chaotic behavior of the ecosystem because if you have fluctuation, well, you know that, uh, well, since you have a number of species which is discrete in principle, you, you have one individual, so you have one, one individual, two individual, three individual. So if you have fluctuations, at a certain point, you have a fluctuation that kill, make extinct a species. And once the species is extinct, it's dead. It's not coming back anymore. So if you have, this means if you have fluctuation, at the very, if you wait long enough, I mean, species will get extinct. And so if you, this means that, well, if you have a dynamic which is chaotic, at the end, everybody is extinct, which means that you cannot have any dynamics because nobody's there. So you cannot have, you cannot see actually endogenous fluctuation. All the fluctuation that you see are exogenous, are due to the environment. 
Well, there have been a lot of discussion about this. And so this is the question that we wanted to address. So the equation that you can, I mean, there is a usual model in uh, a theoretical ecology that I I'm sure you, you heard about in your undergraduate studies. It's the lotka volterra model. So here you have Ni is a variable which is larger or equal to zero. Uh, so it has this kind of evolution. So there is this uh, logistic part. So if it's Ni is too big, it take it back. If Ni is small, it take it back to Ki. Ki is the equilibrium value of Ni. And then you can put interaction between the species. And then you have this term, which is called immigration. So if you have no species, you can put it. If you put it, it, it brings an I positive. And so I goes from 1 to N. As I told you, in experiments, N can be something like 1,000. And so here is, yes, it's a dynamical system in a sense. So you see you have no, no noise. But it's not just a dynamical system. Now, when N becomes large, it's, it's, it's a system that you can really treat with uh, techniques of statistical physics. It's nice that there is also, in recent years, it's been recognized that you can study a kind of mean field version in the sense that when you have, for example, many bacteria interacting together, well, it's a complex system. I mean, it's not known, the, all the couplings are not known. It's known that they can vary a lot. So you can try to do uh, some, uh, to replace the complex interact, I mean, complex variability of the interaction with, the, with some, some disorder, exactly like you do for spin glasses. So you take the alpha j as Gaussian with a variance, which goes like one over n, so here, it's not physics. Alpha j has not to be equal to alpha j i. Well, you know, uh, I mean, it's what I do to a species. It's not what the species do, it's, it's doing to me. So in principle, here you have the alpha j, alpha j i. So the variance connected is equal to gamma sigma square n. So gamma is a kind of asymmetry. And then you can also put a, a, an average value. And so it has been shown that this model actually is quite good, actually, compared to all the models on the market to describe experiment. I mean, as far as we can uh, describe experiment in, in, uh, uh, in ecology. You can do dynamic mean field theory on this model. And then you can get, actually, a closed equation, which is a kind of version of this lotka volterra equation, in which, again, you have the effect of the rest of the system is like a bath. You have a random noise. You have a response function. Now with the gamma in front, you see if gamma is equal to zero, so for example, you have alpha j completely independent from alpha j i, this term is not here, so very different from what you get from equilibrium system, and then you have an average interaction with the rest. And again, self-consistency, I mean, the covariance of the noise is related to a correlation function, this response is the response of a single degree of freedom. So the only thing I want to tell you is that here you can address this question, I mean, the, is there this, is can an ecosystem has some endogenous fluctuations? So in principle, when you study lotka volterra equation, you know that the system can go to an equilibrium or maybe can have some chaotic behavior. Now the question is, okay, if I take a large ecosystem, do I have a chaotic behavior? Do I have equilibria? Do I have stable chaos or not? And what here is, well, using dynamic mean field theory, you can see that there is a transition actually from uh, a regime in which you have one stable equilibrium to a regime in which you have stable chaos uh, if you have, sorry, if you have immigration, so if you have this term. And here is what you get from dynamic mean field theory. So these are different, you see of TT prime, so you see it's time translation invariance. There is no noise here, so there is dynamics in the system which is completely endogenous. And here actually is the different colors correspond to different trajectory of uh, an I, and you see here you have just, well, a system that has its own fluctuation. It's not due to the environment at all. And now, if you kill the immigration, then you can have indeed this, what I told you, that the chaos can kill itself. Uh, and then, well, what you find is that if you have just one community with no immigration, chaos kills itself. So it's true. The intuition that people had is true. But if you actually have different uh, community in which you can have diffusion from one to the other, you can have a metastable state in which you have chaos for a long time, just because well, if here a species goes extinct, but it's not extinct here. Actually, by diffusion, can come here and can put it back. And so if you have several communities, thanks to diffusion, chaos can, can be there. So this has been actually found both in this paper and by, uh, in a work by, by Daniel Fisher and collaborator. OK, so this is, well, the conclusion of it. So the, uh, what I wanted to show you uh, today is that well, first, what is the idea of dynamic mean field theory in classical statistical physics? What are the key steps? And then I wanted to show you that really the MFT is a tool to get complex dynamical phenomena, in, at least in classical statistical physics and also in, in quantum physics. And I told you about three 
different case, which is aging dynamics. So system never at equilibrium. It always remained out of equilibrium. It has aging dynamics. This is example number, example number one. Another example is a system without disorder that has an extremely slow dynamic that emerge and uh, the physics of the glass transition. Then I show you chaos, emergence of chaos in, in ecosystem. And then actually there will be other things that I cannot treat, but which are interesting. So if you study, for example, the dynamics of neural network, like the dynamics of, well, of your brain, uh, well, there are interesting things, uh, interesting issues, whether uh, the, the brain has chaotic dynamics or not. And again, with simple models uh, that you can treat with dynamical mean field theory, you, you can try to address this question and find about chaos in the brain. And then there is, uh, uh, right now, there is a lot of interest to understanding the behavior of optimization algorithm in computer science. When you want to uh, optimize, uh, for, for example, optimize a certain, uh, uh, you have a certain problem in which you find, want to find the, the minimum of what's called the training loss for people that like, for example, machine learning. Well, you use some optimization algorithm that is not so different actually from gradient descent uh, to which we are used in statistical physics. And typically you have to study gradient descent in very high dimension and you can re rewrite this uh, with some approximation as a problem in statistical physics in which you can use, again, DMFT to answer precise question in, in, uh, in the problem of, let's say, optimization algorithm computer science. So this is another uh, field in which I think DMFT is, has potential, has a lot of potential and is used already. All right, with this, thank you very much. And um, thank you. And then you can ask me questions.